Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Jessel Noor in Baltimore. We now bring you part two of our discussion with our guest, uh, Omar Dahi. He's an assistant professor of economics at Hampshire College in Massachusetts. He's an editor at the Middle East Report, and he's of Syrian descent. Um, Robert Fisk of the Independent of London reports that Iran has decided to send 4,000 members of its Revolutionary Guards to Syria. Talk about this latest news in the context of the already expanding sectarian conflict in Syria. Well, sectarianism, since the start of the Arab uprising, in my view, has been the primary tool of counter-revolutionary forces. As soon as the uprisings developed, uh, starting in Tunisia, Egypt, uh, Bahrain, uh, Syria, and elsewhere, um, the Gulf Arab states uh, initially employed sectarianisms for several reasons. The first reason is to try and turn the uprisings demanding social justice, demanding economic equality, demanding freedom, into a, a means of furthering their own influence uh, in these countries and, and supporting the Sunni Islamist forces. For example, in the case of Egypt, uh, the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood has been supported by Qatar directly. Uh, the second uh, reason they initiated this is to stave off um, uh, insurrection in their own countries and to uh, suppress the uh, fear, um, uh, or sorry, to suppress what they feared would be uh, democratic movements growing in the Gulf Arab region. And we have seen, in fact, uh, a mass movement in Bahrain that was brutally suppressed uh, by invoking the sectarian discourse. Uh, and in that uh, the Bahraini uh, uh, freedom movement was simply a tool by Iran to further its interest. So essentially, we need to understand sectarianism as a counter-revolutionary force unleashed by the U.S. allies primarily. Uh, and in the case of Syria, it has been uh, the most uh, obvious uh, because you've seen uh, news stations like Al Jazeera, which was in many ways... Uh, very professional and great uh, news station, uh, despite its minor faults up until the start of the Arab uprisings, but increasingly, and in the case of Syria, completely employ a very sectarian discourse, anti-Shiite, anti-LOI discourse uh, in its coverage. And so, on the other hand, we've seen a reaction uh, uh, by the Syrian regime and its allies, uh, and partly also the Syrian regime itself has invoked the fear and invoked the sectarian discourse, not directly, but invoking the fear of a sectarian takeover to scare its social base into supporting it. So we've seen this vicious dynamic of increasing sectarianism as a way of uh, suppressing the revolutionary movement employed by both the Syrian regime and also forces uh, from inside Syria, some of them and some of them from outside to, to basically uh, divert the uprising. Uh, now, the, the um, involvement of Iran and Hezbollah, as we saw, uh, was, um, if you think about the political support uh, that they've given the Syrian regime, an extension of this. Uh, it's important to uh, backtrack a little bit and uh, uh, to talk honestly about the fact that Hezbollah uh, has been under attack since before the Syrian uprising. A lot of the Gulf uh, allies uh, of the U.S., uh, as well as uh, the U.S. itself, was really displeased, uh, and so was Israel, with the existence of a strong, powerful resistance force in southern Lebanon. So there's been a sectarian agitation against Hezbollah, which preceded the Syrian uprising. And Iran itself, as you know, is under siege. Uh, it's under sanctions. It's constantly under threat as a result of its uh, so-called uh, nuclear enrichment program. Um, and so the increasing geopolitical nature of this has allowed the sectarian conflict to increasingly become at the fore and to drown out the, the mass uh, movement towards social justice, towards a pluralistic uh, transition. And unfortunately, that's what we see as the, as the largest voices today. What has happened to the movement? Well, initially the movement... Uh, withstood several months of brutal repression by the Syrian regime. Uh, thousands of people were tortured, disappeared. Uh, we don't even know the number of people in prison today, aside from the number of dead and aside from the number of wounded who are outside of prison. There may be tens of thousands of prisoners. So initially and continuously, it suffered the wrath 
of the Syrian regime, which responded really with lunatic force. Increasingly, towards the end of 2011 and throughout 2012, we saw the rise of militarism. Uh, and even in the first few months of the uprising, the uprising was overwhelmingly nonviolent, but not exclusively. But the proportion of militarization increased over time. And some of it was indigenous defectors. Uh, some of it was people picking up weapons to defend themselves, which was called as a Free Syrian Army. That continued, I would say, until early 2012, when most of the military opposition became increasingly Salafi groups who were uh, much better equipped, much better funded, and much more skilled and determined fighters who were uh, ideologically motivated. And they became more effective at fighting the Syrian regime but it came at the expense of completely marginalizing uh, the nonviolent movement. Now, there are people who still heroically go out in demonstrations. In the territories that are outside regime control, we see people coming out to demonstrate against the Salafi groups like Jabhat al-Nusra. We see them demonstrating against some Free Syrian Army groups because of the corruption of the, some of the Free Syrian Army units. So it's, it's not fair to say that the nonviolent movement has been completely silenced. It continues. And in the minds of many Syrians on the ground, it does continue. But really, it's become very minimal compared to the overwhelming violence and the multiple layers of conflict and war uh, that is happening. There are millions of people who now just have to worry about daily survival, food, shelter, and clothing. And it's hard to see that these people lacking the basic food and nourishment security can carry out uh, 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 basic uh, survival, let alone carrying out demonstrations against the uh, uh, Syrian regime, which is why a political settlement, a truce, some sort of way to end the violence or minimize the violence as quickly as possible is a prerequisite for a meaningful type of transition. Now, the U.S. has vowed to only fund and arm secular forces in Syria, uh, secular parts of the opposition, um, is that possible to do, considering how factional the opposition is? Well, I believe the term they use is moderate. I don't think um, they really um, uh, are using the word secular for many reasons, uh, not least of which is that uh, most uh, 95 to 100 percent of the fighting forces, even if they were not uh, explicitly Salafi, they don't identify with the word secular. Um, I think it's an illusion to say that you can pick and choose who you can fund and you can control who you fund. Um, it's basically time and time again, we've seen that that's not possible, which is not to say that, that we should cast uh, uh, non-secular uh, forces all in the same light, nor is it uh, to say that all the Islamist fighting forces are extremists who will um, uh, basically attack uh, US interests and so forth. Um, but uh, really, the idea that you can control the dynamics of uh, arming and funding armed groups is, um, is just silly. And finally, can you talk a little more about just who the U.S. has allied itself uh, with around the region? Um, to, yeah, so talk, talk, about the, talk more about who the U.S. has allied itself in the Middle East. Well, I think looking at U.S. alliances in the Middle East helps shed better light on what the U.S. is doing in Syria. And I think it's safe to say that the U.S. knows a lot more what it doesn't want in the case of Syria than what it does want. The biggest alliance, of course, is with the state of Israel. Uh, for many years, the, the Syrian regime, even though it allied itself with forces opposed to Israel, such as Iran and Hezbollah, uh, was the perfect enemy for Israel. In a sense, it was the enemy that was stable, predictable, kept the northern front of Israel uh, basically quiet. There was no resistance based in Syria for the last 30, 40 years. Syria never retaliated directly to any attack, in including the most recent attacks uh, by Israel during the uprising, before the uprising. So the primary interests of the U.S. and Israel are preventing regime collapse in Syria. They don't mind bleeding the regime. They don't mind uh, the bloodshed, really, as long as it becomes contained. Uh, that's the primary ally of Israel. And uh, in many ways, it's, it's uh, basically a cynical uh, 
uh, type of uh, um, policy because uh, their goal is really neither pro-regime nor pro-opposition. It's whatever maintains stability. The other main allies, of course, are the Gulf Arab states, Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Um, of course, non-democratic uh, uh, regime. Saudi Arabia is one of the most uh, repressive undemocratic regimes in the world. A uh, very conservative, reactionary ideology that has been spreading throughout the region uh, and throughout the Muslim world, really funding the Wahhabi type of ideology. Uh, so those are really the, the U.S. Uh, allies in the region. Now, there's a slight discrepancy between what the Gulf allies have done and wanted in Syria and what the U.S. and Israel has wanted. And that's why you see Syria... Uh, Excuse me. That's why you see the U.S. increasingly marginalize Qatar, which they saw as funding too many groups, uh, which uh, might cause a problem to Israel. Uh, and that's why you've seen the U.S. and Israel, uh, uh, what well, mainly the U.S., uh, vetoing the kind of weapons that the rebels can use. The uh, flow of weapons has been calibrated such that the rebels are not completely vanquished, but neither do they have the ability, the ability to one day. Uh, really pose a threat to Israel. Uh, and that's why you see part of this dynamic as a sort of an endless civil war rather than an all-out victory uh, for one side or the other. Should people be concerned that this arming of Syrian rebels um, will or may possibly lead to um, further and greater U.S. involvement and intervention in this conflict? Well, I think the U.S. is increasingly going to get drawn one way or another. Uh, I think uh, people should be opposed of increasing the armaments. I think people should be concerned about the humanitarian catastrophe that is happening to Syrians, primarily. If the U.S. increases its involvement in terms of humanitarian aid, in terms of helping the refugees and internally displaced, I think that's fine. The question is, what kind of involvement do we want? We want an involvement that increases... Uh, uh, assistance for the Syrians and all the people affected by the tragedy to recuperate their lives. What we don't want is further militarization uh, that, that increases the cycle of violence. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.